might not realize how often ministers agonize in the week or weeks before a highly anticipated event like the midterm elections over what exactly to say on the Sunday afterward. What tone should we take? If it's celebratory, some people whose candidate or cause has lost might be jarred. If it's commiserating, you miss those who are feeling elated. It's a no-win situation. It's one that I and my colleagues faced two years ago in the wake of the presidential election. I was preaching then, too, in Fall River and to a politically mixed congregation. The sermon I gave then was titled, Coming Together in Love. There was a need for healing. Raw wounds of racism, sexism, xenophobia, economic oppression, just to name a few, had been opened up and salt had been poured on them for many of us. We ended, as many congregations did that Sunday, with an ode to shattered hopes and dreams, Leonard Cohen's halting, haunting ballad, Hallelujah. This week, anticipating that many of us might feel somewhat unmoored, as we navigated the mixed results of the election, Melissa carville Zemer, acting executive director of the UU Ministers Association, offered us a conference call, what to preach after the election. It wasn't a question, and it wasn't a direction. It was an open forum for any of us, and not just first-year ministers, I have to say, who were struggling a bit. We covered a lot of ground in that conversation with ministers from all over the country, but one theme, one phrase, that had already resonated with me as soon as I heard it, struck a chord with all of us. Ayanna Presley's reference to the seismic shifts beginning to happen. This descriptive term for a drastic change in landscape caused by an earthquake is a hopeful metaphor for the shifts that this election may have initiated. In our worship planning sessions two weeks ago, I called this service still here as a kind of placeholder for the unknown. All we know right now, I said then, is we'll still be here. And thank you so much, Adrian, not seeing him now, and Brian, um, for that beautiful rendition of the Williams Brothers ballad. I love these lyrics especially. Lied on. Many times I've been lied on, but I'm still here. Burdens, I had to bear so many burdens, but I'm still here. Dark days, I've had my share of dark days, but I'm still here. Disappointments, I've had so many disappointments, but I'm still here. Those words were speaking about the resolution and strength of the black community who stood up and spoke out about racism and oppression for decades before most of us answered that call. Legacy is our worship theme for this month. And we have to wonder, what might our legacy be after the brutal, brutal divisiveness of so much of the past weeks, including two horrifying mass shootings? and highlighting the racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and sexism still alive and well in this country. I think many of us resonate deeply with those song lyrics today, especially after the past two years. We've been lied to, seen dark days, had disappointments, but we're still here. And I have to say, post-election, I'm feeling a bit more hopeful, a little encouraged. I think maybe we're feeling the winds of change, and here are some of the things that made me feel hopeful, like this. Right? Yes. I know, right? It is a travesty of justice that we ever brought the human rights of anyone in this state to a vote. 
especially those who are already fighting mightily to be safe and seen and heard and respected. Here in Massachusetts, which we thought of as a leader in LGBTQ rights, to bring those rights to a popular vote, well, it was just wrong, wrong, wrong. In spite of all that, this is a huge win. And not just a win for our transgender siblings, although I have beloved friends who sobbed in relief on election night. But it is a win for all of us who believe that there is, who believe in freedom and justice and equality, and who believe that there is goodness in all of us, and that when asked, we can rise to the occasion and do the right thing. This is a win for each and every one of us. And then there was this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful picture. And I'm just going to keep that up there because this, this is what democracy looks like. These are the faces of the future, the faces of hope and new vision, of true equality. This right here, this is a picture of a seismic shift. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the youngest woman elected to Congress. Ilhan Omar, the first Muslim Somali-American elected to Congress. Ayanna Presley, the first black congresswoman from Massachusetts. Rashida Tlaib, the first Muslim Palestinian-American congresswoman. Sharice Davids, the first indigenous American woman elected to Congress. Veronica Escobar and Sylvia Garcia, the first Texas Latinas elected to Congress. And there are more. A record 117 women elected to office, the highest number ever. And people of color, the highest number of people of color and openly LGBTQ candidates elected by far. And as someone pointed out, this is 100 years after women got the vote three generations, and just a bit over 50 years that people of color have had full voting rights. Two generations. It is about time. It's been a long time coming. It took hard work with a lot of heartbreak along the way. But what's right doesn't always come easily. The higher good sometimes takes longer to break through. And as, again, as Ayanna Presley, that's her in the lower left corner, said on election night, people of color don't speak of glass ceilings, they speak of concrete ones. But what breaks through concrete? Seismic shifts. Well, maybe, just maybe, that seismic shift is beginning. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. It started with the women's marches in January 2017 in those pink pussy hats we were all wearing. Then the Me Too movement caught fire, and women began to sense that their stories were maybe going to be listened to this time, that maybe, just maybe, we were going to make a dent in the sexist, old boys, business as usual ways. So much more happened in the last two years, more events that gave us glimmers of hope, like the March for Our Lives, those brilliant young people leading, and all of the vigils, marches, demonstrations against the Muslim ban, family separation, the criminal justice system, the Kavanaugh decision. And this week, we showed that we, the people, we are paying attention. We are watching and listening. We are not going to sleep through the next two years. The people, freedom, democracy, and justice had a lot of wins this week, and we are still here. Another big win was that voting rights were restored in Florida to nearly 1.4 million of those formerly incarcerated. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that for sure. With the support of nearly 65% of Florida voters, this is an amendment to the state constitution lifting a permanent ban on voting by anyone with a criminal record. It means that the potential electorate in Florida will grow now by more than 400,000 re-enfranchised African Americans. It's beautiful. Hearing that news, well, it's personal. It made me think about my friend Shatira, the inmate I've been visiting at MCI Framingham since 2012. She goes by T. 
two years ago, won an appeal of her case. Instead of a natural life sentence, meaning she would be there for her natural life, she may only have another five years, a total of 15 if she's lucky, away from her family, rarely seeing her now 19-year-old son locked up with several hundred other women. If any of you have ever watched Orange is the New Black, well, it's not very much like that, except for the cruelty and power plays, the hazing and bullying, currying favor with the guards, isolation, the whole, all that part's true. The simple act of visiting Chatira, this bright, positive, powerful, and deeply faithful young woman, has been nothing short of life-changing for me. Sitting with T in prison puts things into perspective. Every time I go to Framingham, every single time, no matter how long it's been since I made it out there, she greets me with a huge hug, like I'm her long-lost friend. No, like I'm her sister, her best friend, her family. Shatira has a smile that literally lights up the room, and that's really saying something when the room is a gray-walled sitting area with rows of plastic seats and narrow barred windows. T eagerly accepts whatever the vending machines have to offer, and she talks pretty much nonstop about her life in prison, her hopes and dreams, her family, her friends and lovers, oh, and school. She's in a BU prison to college program, and that's why I go there. I'm there as her mentor. But believe me, the mentoring, it goes both ways. She fell in love with philosophy in a class a couple of years ago, and she is an amazing thinker. I've rarely been with anyone who so often and sincerely expresses how grateful they are for all they have and where they are. In her early years, she admits she was angry and resentful. She spent a lot of time fighting with the other girls and in the hole. That's been behind her now for a while. T mentors the new girls as they come in, tries to help them see the chance they have to turn things around. She says of her homeless, drug-addicted life before she was arrested, when I was out there, I was strung out all the time, walking around all day, just trying to figure out how to get a shower, clean clothes, a meal, all day long, and then start the next day. Here, she says, I have a bed, clean sheets and clothes, a little bag of things, but they're mine, a shower whenever I want it. I tell the other girls, you have a chance here. Use it. Go to the groups, take classes, clean yourself up. You can see that the other girls look up to T. She is a leader in prison. Last time I saw Chatira, she told me about a place where she can stand every night and watch the sunset, a place in the building where she can see, as she said, the whole sunset. Can you believe it? Now she says, it's my favorite part of the day. I never even noticed the sunset before I came here, and now I love to stand there. She's a poet. She's working on a memoir, finding herself in prison. When I leave, I sit in the parking lot and make notes about what we've talked about, what she said. I'm technically making my report to the prison to college organization, but it's much more than that. I do it because I just don't want to forget, because what she says is often just stunning, and because I care about her more than I ever would have thought possible. Someone whose life in every respect could not be more different from my own, and yet someone I connect with more deeply than I do many of my Lexington neighbors. I truly can say that we love each other. But I worry. I worry about what her life will be like when she gets out. She'll see the parole board sometime in the next two years. She's working every program they have, a speaker's bureau, learning cosmetology, training a service dog, anything to show that she's ready to return to the outside, ready to be a good citizen. 
I'm amazed at her drive, and I worry. Where can she live? Safely away from her past neighborhoods and the temptations there, what kind of work will she be able to get as a felon? Will she be able to stay with it, to keep her resolution to do good, be a role model for her son? The thing is, I know I'm in it for the long haul with T. Technically, my mentoring will be over when she leaves prison, but I and the other UU minister who visits T, we have already decided that we will stay in her life. We will do what we can to support her, following her lead, of course, being there as much or as little as she wants. I think that that's the fulfillment not just of an obligation, that's the fulfillment of my deepest calling, my true nature, to love as deeply and as fully as I can. That's who I am. And it's that kind of goodness that's really the only thing that's worth anything in my lexicon. So, my beloveds, Let's make this commitment here together today, now that we've had some wins, now that we've seen what we can do. Let's build a community, a state, a nation whose greatness is not defined as being the biggest, the best, the most powerful, the richest. Let's let our greatness be in our capacity for valuing and celebrating the differences among us appreciating each other's gifts and talents. Let's support and move forward the ideas and goals of young people, people of color, former inmates, immigrants, women, people of all gender identities and sexual orientations, especially those of us with any kind of privilege of skin color, class, gender, age, education, other advantages. Let's set things right and work on reparations for the injustices created by racism, sexism, economic oppression. And on top of that, why not try to love everyone we meet? Aim for that level of goodness. I'm going to end with the words of yet one more prophet in our time, Stacey Abrams, who may yet be elected the first black woman governor. She says, I need you to know that it is my mission to serve you, to serve Georgia, to make you proud. She said this during her non-concession speech. And for those who didn't pick me the first time to change your mind about me and what we can accomplish together, across our state, Folks are opening up the dreams of voters in absentee ballots, she says, and we believe our chance for a stronger Georgia is just within reach, but we cannot seize it until all voices are heard. We are writing the next chapter of Georgia's future where no one is unseen, no one is unheard, and no one is uninspired. We are writing a history of Georgia where we prosper together. My friends, may the winds of change keep blowing, the seismic shift keep shaking this land until no one is unseen, no one is unheard, no one is uninspired, and we prosper together. Let us have a politics of joy. That will be a legacy of which we can all be proud. Amen. Blessed be.